Please love the problem more than the solution and more than the technology. Because remember that to be really successful, we really want to feel, we want to empower and liberate our customers. And remember that it's not how smart we are as entrepreneurs, it's how smart and how liberated we make our customers feel that will be a driver for success. It's all about your attitude during these times of crisis, I think that really can help propel a company or squash it. You know, there's always things that the world is going to throw at you. And it is gonna be how you react to that condition that makes you either a woe is me, I've gotta hunker down and save my money, or man, this is gonna be it for us. I'm a Dell Technologies advisor. Ich auch. And if you're a small business, we're with you. We are with you. Estamos com você. We want to help. So we'll be right here. At home. Answering your calls. Providing support. And standing by you. Every step of the way. Bye-bye. I would like to welcome Jeff Miller, president of Jam Ventures, to introduce the opening grand keynote. Here are a few words um, on Jeff. Jeff Miller is president of Jam Ventures, a business consulting company. Prior to, prior to establishing this firm, Jeff spent most of his career in operating companies. He was associated with Documentum Inc., uh, ticker symbol DCTM, an enterprise document management software company as a CEO and chairman for a decade. He was instrumental in growing it from 15 employees into a publicly traded company with 1,200 employees and revenues over 200 million. Jeff has more than 45 years of high-tech experience in semiconductors, hardware, and software companies. He has held senior marketing and executive positions at Adaptech and Cadence Design Systems. Jeff was also a former venture partner with Redpoint Ventures, focused on mentoring CEOs of several Redpoint companies. Jeff has also been on the board of several tech companies and is currently a board member of service now. Jeff also serves on many philanthropic boards. Prominent among them are the Golden State Warriors Community Foundation, the Santa Clara University Board of Trustees, and the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship. By the way, he's a minority owner of the Golden State Warriors. Jeff has an MBA and a BS in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from Santa Clara U. Over to you, Jeff, to introduce Fred and CJ. Thank you, Kamar. My unmuted here, there we go. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Kumar said, I'm Jeff Miller, the lead independent director for ServiceNow, and it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Fred Letty, our founder and chairman, and CJ Desai, our chief products officer. I've had the honor of being part of ServiceNow for almost 10 years, and have watched it grow from $70 million in revenue to this year's guidance of over four and a half billion and in employees from 200 people, almost all in San Diego, to over 12,000 globally, while literally redefining the way our customers work. A remarkable run that is a very long way from being over. But a run like ours all starts with a determined founder, Fred Luddy, a world-class visionary developer and company founder who from day one focused himself and the company on keeping it simple and delighting the customer. But Fred is much more than just supremely talented. He also has the humility and self-awareness to know when he, where he's not world-class. I met Fred in the fall of 2010, shortly after Sequoia invested in ServiceNow, when at Doug Leone's urging, Fred came up from San Diego to spend a day meeting with a series of experienced CEOs, starting with Breakfast With Me. At this point, Fred had run ServiceNow for seven years, had taken it from inception to that $70 million revenue run rate on an absurdly small amount of funding. 
Prior to Sequoia's hyper-growth oriented investment, Fred had raised just one round of funding of seven and a half million dollars and had only used two and a half million to get the company to cash flow positive. So Fred and his team were certainly doing lots of things right. But a day of meeting with top-notch CEOs correctly convinced Fred that his company could do better with new, more experienced leadership. Not an easy conclusion for someone who was being very successful in growing his company, but rather an honest, insightful evaluation of what he personally wanted to do and was great at, which was developing products. I joined the board shortly thereafter, and together with Fred and Doug, helped hire Frank Slootman to be our first non-founder CEO. Frank was a phenomenal CEO who, with Fred as Chief Products Officer, drove ServiceNow to a billion dollars in revenue by 2015. By late 2016, Fred had been running hard daily for 13 years and decided to retire from his operational job, but remained a board member. And ServiceNow was fortunate enough to hire CJ to run all products. CJ has performed magnificently for us these past four years, deepening the power of our platform while also reacting very quickly when required as he and the team did this year in developing in literally a few short weeks, a set of COVID emergency response management apps, and then lately a new set of safe workplace apps to help customers, employees return to work. But not even the most successful journey is without a few bumps along the way. When we were, when we were trying to attract CJ and get him to come to service now, one of the real reasons for his excitement was he wanted to work for Frank Slootman because Frank really is and, and uh, was and is, by the way, Frank's about ready to take another company public now, uh, Snowflake. Uh, he miserably failed retirement. That's a different story. Um, but unknown to CJ at the time, because we're a public company, we have confidentiality requirements, Frank and the board have been working together for a, a long time. And Frank had been kind of driving his own long-term succession plan. And so in February 2017, barely six weeks after CJ joined, we announced Frank's retirement and that his successor was John Donahoe, former eBay CEO. Thankfully, CJ by this time was smitten by the energy at the company and developed a close relationship with John. Perhaps one trait that helped CJ handle what could have been a tough situation with great grace is his sense of humor. A little known fact, in a previous life, our CJ was a stand-up comic. I don't think there's a lot of chief product officers that you know have a side gig as a stand-up comic. His jokes and his ability to make his team smile are well known at ServiceNow. Although frankly, seeing how good an executive he is, my advice is uh, don't quit your day job, CJ. You, you found your calling. It all started with Fred, so I'll close with a last Fred story. A year after John took over as CEO, Frank was transitioning off the board, and the expectation and the plan was to make John both CEO and chairman. But John attended Knowledge, our users conference, and saw Fred's keynote. And what he saw was an outpouring of adulation and respect for Fred from both our customers and our employees. So he called me with a wild idea. Instead of John being chairman, let's make Fred chairman and keep ServiceNow's startup energy going as long as possible. So with no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, our energizer bunny, Fred Lenny, and the man that runs all products, CJ Desai. Thank you very much. As the world reopens, ServiceNow is helping customers make sure going back to the workplace works for everyone. Introducing the Safe Workplace apps and dashboard, 
Four apps specifically designed to help ensure the health and safety of your workforce and workplace. All housed in a single dashboard to give you a comprehensive look into everything you need to know. And they're available now, out of the box, powered by the Now platform. Get a bird's eye view to make sure your employees are prepared and ready to go back to the workplace. Manage inventory levels across your organization thanks to workplaces that automatically replenish supplies. Screen and verify the health of your employees and help manage workflows for cleaning, sanitation and safe distancing for employees. Four essential apps, one comprehensive dashboard. Together we can make sure going back to the workplace can work for everyone. That's the power of the Now platform. It is a pleasure and honor for me to be speaking with Fred Luddy, our founder and chairman of the board. And as Jeff stated, uh, Fred retired from ServiceNow in 2016 in the management role as a chief product officer. And I started in 2016 and it has been an amazing ride in delivering for our customers. So we are going to have a little bit fun I'm going to ask the typical questions that are usually asked in this panel. And I'm going to ask some fun questions in between just to throw Fred off a little bit uh, in terms of trying to make some humor here. So let's start first. So typically, Fred, these questions are asked at the end that what's your one advice, two advice, or three advice for entrepreneurs, given we have this amazing global audience if you have to say one thing to all the entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, what would be that one thing and your one advice to them? Uh, I, I would say, please love the problem more than the solution and more than the technology. Because remember that to be really successful, we really want to feel, we want to empower and liberate our customers. And remember that it's not how smart we are as entrepreneurs, it's how smart and how liberated we make our customers feel that'll be a driver for success. That makes a lot of sense. And Fred, you know, uh, Jeff talked about ServiceNow. ServiceNow went IPO in 2012. And if you had invested a dollar in ServiceNow in 2012, the shareholders now have gotten a return of 2100%. It has been an amazing ride and we are just getting started. But Fred, you know, you created a platform company and for many entrepreneurs, uh, especially in Silicon Valley on how they idolize them and others is that, hey, this person dropped out from Stanford or this person was a PhD student at College X or this fancy college Y. Tell us about your beginnings. Where did you learn programming? Where did you work? And just give us some insight into how you got into programming. Uh, okay. Um, you know, we, we all have challenges in our lives. And, and my challenge um, became pretty apparent very early on. Um, I was allegedly a bright kid, but I was an absolutely horrible student. Um, you know, I was happy to get a C minus on my report card in anything. And it turns out that I'm, I'm an Asperger's person, you know, mild, mildly autistic. And Aspies have a hard time, if not impossible time, concentrating on things they're not interested in. So I got, you know, just, just horrible, horrible grades until I got to like third year in high school and I found out that I loved organic chemistry of all things. You know, it's like, oh, organic chemistry, that's, that's crazy. So I also had a fairly rough childhood, so much so that I actually left home <clears throat> When I was 16 and I, I lived in a station wagon, I picked strawberries, I worked in a car wash and my, my career goal was to become an assistant manager at a gas station. Luckily that, that, that didn't pan out. During one of my uh, jobs though, I, I, was, I walked into a computer room and they had just installed this new uh, HP computer and I just never, I just knew that was where I wanted to be for the rest of my life. I never wanted to leave. I just fell in love with programming and I, I, I got a job programming luckily. Um, and I think the thing that, that, that really drove me was that I worked on behalf of some order entry clerks and I created a feature for one of them at their request. And this woman tried out the feature that I had built that saved her a lot of time. 
And at the end of, of trying it out, she cried. And I thought, oh my gosh, I made a woman cry because she's happy. This is wonderful. Like what a great thing this programming is. And from then on, I've always loved the end user experience and, and you know, I've always wanted to do something with technology that made my customers feel smarter. That's amazing, Fred. And I know that we still have the same ethos in ServiceNow or making sure that our end users are always happy. So I'm gonna switch it a little bit uh, on the trivia side. So talking about humble beginnings, uh, from what I understand that you were also a tennis ball boy <laughs> on clay courts in Indiana when you were in your teen years and have seen many amazing tennis players play. But I'm gonna ask you since Indian community and South Asian community loves tennis. Uh, so one of the questions I have is, Vijay Amritraj or Leander Pace? Uh, you know, I, I know them both and, and they're both absolutely wonderful people, but, and they're great ambassadors for tennis, but, but they're very different. And so it's hard to pick. I mean, what, what, you know, Vijay has done so much more than just, just tennis, right? He's been involved in many different things, both in India and, and the United States. He's a, he, he's really larger than life. I mean, the man is, is huge. When I stand next to my, his shoulders are about here. Um, and he's just, he's, he's a wonderful person. Leander is an, he's a magical tennis player, but I would say that the reason I love Leander is he's really inspired so many kids to pick up the game. And I find that this is a game that you have all your life and that you, 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 you live in a tennis community and it's really a wonderful thing. So I can't pick between the two of them because they're so different. That's a great answer. So coming back to your uh, journey, Fred, you know, you talked about your humble beginnings in Indiana. Uh, when did you come to Silicon Valley and what was it like? I, I read an article um, in Computer World about a fellow by the name of Gene Amdahl, who was the father of the, uh, of, of the mainframe. And then I saw an ad that said, come and work for Gene Amdahl. So I I, I got a job in Silicon Valley working at the Andal Corporation mainframe computer company, and it was absolutely magical. There were 350 of us that were competing against IBM, who had 400,000 people and an 85% market share. And um, what was great is everybody in that company pulled together because somebody did the math and said, if every one of us is smarter than 99%, of the IBMers, they still have more smart people than we do. So the only way we can win this battle is if we pull together as a team. And I had gotten there as, as the youngest and most inexperienced but eager to learn person. And everybody just helped me out. They really taught me things, they mentored me. I, I called a friend of mine 30 years later. And I said, Stu, thank you so much for your mentorship. He said, mentorship? We didn't have any mentorship. I didn't even think we had that word then. We were just all trying to pull each other along so that we could win that battle. Cloud is it, great. Was, it was just it an absolute It solves a lot of real world place. problems, but it's not just one cloud anymore. Public clouds, private clouds, edge clouds. The average business uses five different cloud providers. It's become chaotic and complex. With unpredictable costs, inconsistent security, multiple management tools, and different formats for workloads that span cloud platforms and providers. But it doesn't have to be that way. The Dell Technologies Cloud, powered by VMware, can be the one constant across your clouds. It brings consistent infrastructure and operations to your multi-cloud environment, so you can choose the right cloud for each application. A public cloud that lets you easily tap into services. A private cloud that's fully under your control. Or the edge, with cloud as a service. With a true hybrid cloud experience, your business becomes more agile with simple workload migration and easy onboarding for new assets. Your teams get to market faster with simplified operations and automated processes. You reduce risk and strengthen your security profile. And with Dell Technologies Cloud, you have flexible consumption options, reducing your total cost of ownership. Like it or not, the business world often requires many clouds. Now, that's easier than ever with consistent infrastructure, operations, and services across all your clouds. You get the cloud without the chaos. The Dell Technologies Cloud.
That's amazing. And, you know, Fred, uh, I know you spent a few years at Amdahl, but coming back to your true entrepreneurship journey in the sense of starting service now, uh, I would love for you to share at what age you started service now <laughs> and how you became broke at Peregrine Systems and just <laughs> share with us uh, that whole story and what happened in 2004. Well, going broke was pretty easy. Uh, I used to, I worked for a company called Peregrine and we had a, a good market cap. And so I would get up in the morning, with, get my coffee and, and I would go to Yahoo and check the stock price because it was going up, you know, and nicely. And my, my brother came in and he said, what's wrong? I said, well, Yahoo's broken. What do you mean? Well, it says the stock's worth nothing. And um, so Yahoo was not broken. Yahoo Finance was correct. I went from having a, a net worth of $35 million to zero uh, instantly. Um, and so my brother and I looked at each other and he is also working at Peregrine. And he said, what should we do now? I said, well, we can start a new business. I mean, what else is there to do, right? And so <clears throat> that was really the, uh, that was the genesis or the catalyst for, for starting a new company because uh, there was nothing left to lose. Um, and the date was November 5th, 2003, that I wrote the first lines of code. And I remember writing it then because I was uh, two weeks from my 50th birthday. And I thought nobody's going to take a 50 year old seriously as being an entrepreneur. So I had to start it when I was on the other side of, of 50 years old. That's, that's excellent. And, you know, I do want the entrepreneurs to know that Fred still quotes. Uh, he created a COVID-19 tracker early in April, was super excited to share with a few of us uh, at ServiceNow, the app, and he developed an AWS using all the lang latest set of tools and services in Amazon. So even today, uh, Fred keeps himself busy by making sure that he's still coding. So Fred, related to starting ServiceNow, uh, the concepts that everybody talks about today, such as cloud computing, uh, platform as a service, PaaS, these concepts were not known, API-driven architectures in 2004. So what was the genesis? Like, how did you and the early team said, hey, we are going to provide the services over cloud, service now over cloud, and ensure that we provide a true world-class enterprise platform where people can build applications? Uh, you know, that, that journey just, just seemed to make sense because, um, in, in 19, in the late 1990s, there was this, this dot com bubble. And in the middle of that explosion was something called application service providers, ASPs, where the whole notion was we're going to take software, enterprise software, and we're going to run it in a data center on your behalf. The issue is with that was, it seemed like a good idea. But software actually has to be written to be serviced from the inside rather than the outside. And so that, that model consumed billions and billions of dollars in investment, but in fact never went anywhere except it, it just blew up. But to me, it made a lot of sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rather than, um, rather than us as a small company trying to teach a thousand other companies how to install and care for our software, what seemed to be a better idea was just, have us take care of the software for them, take care of, you know, the infrastructure, the backup, the recovery, um, the security, et cetera. And then, you know, we, we would have control of the environment. So again, it was really born out of the fact that we didn't have enough people to write installation manuals and installers and right. deal with nine different databases and 15 different server platforms. So it was just easier for us to do it ourselves. Now, <laughs> the initial, the the uh, initial server was a was a used super micro that we got off eBay for eight hundred dollars, and we uh, put it in a telco closet that was ninety five degrees, and our our business continuity strategy was was largely prayer. <laughs> That's amazing, and you know now the concepts such as cloud computing as well as platform as a service have become ubiquitous and. Uh, this was done out of necessity, not only for a company to survive, but it looks like for a company to scale. As we like to say, necessity is a mother. Yes, exactly. So Fred, coming back to short questions, 
Uh, you started a platform company, ServiceNow still is a platform company, a digital platform company. When you look at the consumer industry, which platform company you think is the most innovative for consumers, Tesla or Apple? Oh, you know, the, those are both <clears throat> great companies. They're, they're a little different, but I think if you go back to my initial answer and you take a look at Tesla and Apple, they both engender fierce loyalty by their customers. Mm -hmm. And they do that because I think they care about their customers and, and want to do things for their customers in ways that, that others don't. So their focus is really on, on customer delight. And it turns out that you know, profitability is, is something that follows the customer delight. So uh, as, a, as an all out you know, broad platform, I have to go with Apple. But as far as someone who just inspires us to, to think differently, I have to go with Elon. That's awesome. So Fred, we are currently in this global pandemic. You even wrote an app for it. And you know, many entrepreneurs are dealing with challenges. And I remember <clears throat> reading about this in uh, 2008, that one of the VC firms sent out this note during the peak of global financial crisis. And ServiceNow was only five years old at the time. Tell me, what did you tell the team when it was doom gloom scenarios uh, middle of financial crisis because the entrepreneurs today are facing the exact same thing. There are certain winners, certain losers, certain industries who are impacted with this crisis. There's a scene from Apollo 13 where the government people are so worried about the fact that we might lose astronauts in space. And um, <clears throat> the fellow that was the head of NASA turned to the government people and said, this will not be a disaster. In fact, this will be our finest hour. And so I, I I had that same attitude with the financial crisis and that, you know, we, we were going up against incumbents, people like, like, like IBM and Hewlett Packard and, and, and our, our prospects were, uh, were absolutely swimming in cash and they were very happy. Um, but then the financial crisis hit and all of a sudden they're drowning in red ink. And we thought we can go in and talk to name anybody on wall street, name anybody in, you know, in many industries, and we, we can not only give them better technology, but we can give it to them at a lower price. And by a lower price, I mean less green dollars out, not, not you know, efficiency numbers, not soft savings, but, but real green dollars. So I think the way to think of it is that there's, you know, there's always things that the world is going to throw at you. And it is going to be how you react to that condition that makes you either a woe is me, I've got to hunker down and save my money, or man, this is going to be it for us. And we're all coming to you via Zoom. And I don't know, Zoom has now become a word like Xerox. You know, it's become a word like, like, clean, like you, Kleenex. It's, it, it is just how we do things, right? And um, Zoom was, again, they, I'm, I'm not sure how uh, Eric and, and crew took a look at this, but it was just a phenomenal opportunity for them. And then you know, it's just, it's all about your attitude during these times of crisis, I think that really can help propel a company or squash you. Exactly. And definitely you all survived and then went public in 2012. So uh, Fred, you know, one of the things that when I speak to entrepreneurs and ServiceNow has definitely uh, acquired a few companies over time, we tend to do a lot of technology tuck-ins and then entrepreneurs become part of our team with great energy and some of the best team members we have were previous entrepreneurs. But one of the things that I know when even you were going public in 2012 or just before you went public, you also got an offer to be acquired. And when you think of TAM, the valuation, how long you should keep going to scale the company, give us some perspectives on that. How did you turn down the 2011 offer? Well, that was difficult. Um, so I remember at that time I was, you know, 55 years old. I had a, a young son. I had been absolutely broke many times in my life, living in a car, not being able to pay my rent. And all of a sudden somebody offered me a check, a personal check for over a hundred million dollars. And I was like, oh, this is it. My family will be taken care of now for the rest of my life. Luckily, we had a, a fellow by the name of Doug Leone on our board from Sequoia. And he said, that's a horrible deal. He said, this is going to be worth 10 X what they're offering you at the time. It was a, a billion dollars. And um, I, I just said, but 
but my family would be taken care of. And he said, it's a horrible deal. Turns out Doug was wrong. It wasn't 10X, it was 90X. So in any case, hopefully, um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the things about service now is that we did a lot of things because we didn't know any better. And had I not had somebody to listen to in many cases, I would have made a lot more mistakes. But because Doug was there uh, and he, he helped in many ways, but that was what the best thing that ever happened to me was not getting that money. That's, that's excellent. And that's a great story because, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs face that, do I need to raise a round if I have a great offer and a great home? How do I make the decision? And that decision making is definitely not an easy one. How to balance investors, customers, and your employees. So uh, short question, streaming services. There are so many of them now. Uh, which streaming service you love? Netflix, Disney Plus, or any other? Well, um, I like all the streaming services, but I wish somebody would solve the problem that I was watching Mrs. Maisel. Which one's that on? Or where did we subscribe to SpongeBob? You know, like my Samsung TV has like all these different apps and I have to search for them. So I hope somebody, to me, that's a real challenge. It used to be go through 500 channels. Now I got to go through 10 streaming services each have 500 channels. So that's an issue. It is lovely that everything's on demand. Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that I, I actually just Apple Music is probably my best streaming service. That's great. So um, Fred, you know, now switching gears a little bit, uh, you know, you created ServiceNow. ServiceNow is having a great run and we are just getting started as we always talk with our teams. But you have done some wonderful things for Indiana University. You know, as a South Asian community, we really put focus on education and you give the second biggest gift to Indiana University, that is the Ludi School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering, as well as Center for Artificial Intelligence. Why Indiana University and why specifically those disciplines? Well, um, I was fortunate enough to uh, go to school for a short time at, at IU and I worked for um, the Dean of Economics who is somebody that that made me believe in myself, which was something I, I, I hadn't done prior to that. I think I was eight, 18 or so at the time. And so his, his, um, his mentorship was, was really just something that I think made my whole life uh, better. And um, so I went back to visit IU some 40 years later, and I went to visit the Dean of the Informatics School and his office was my old bedroom in the fraternity house where I had lived. It was crummy when I lived there and it was worse when I, I said, Bobby, this is, you're never gonna be able to recruit the best here. And he said, well, we have this plan, but we're short a few you know, dollars. I said, let me help you. And, and, and so we, I, I just helped fuel the, uh, the economics of, of building this first building. But here's my belief is that you know, there's no, no geography, no race, no uh, center of gravity for, for IQ and, and, and ingenuity and creativity. It just happens that, you know, the, the, the two coasts of the United States have attracted, you know, people for a long time. And what I wanted to do is help move that center of gravity into the Midwest. And it, that center of gravity, by the way, can disperse, be dispersed all over the globe. And with a relatively uh, modest gift uh, compared to, uh, things on, in West Coast universities, we were able to build an entire quadrangle full of buildings. Um, and what that means uh, to the university is they can now, with this beautiful facility, recruit great, you know, great, great, great faculty, and they can recruit great students. And so the opportunity to really open that up in the Midwest, I think, was, was, was quite inspirational. I'm re really proud to be part of it. That's, that's amazing, Fred, and that's so inspirational. Uh, when we get resume for internships now, as well as uh, fresh graduates from IU, sometimes your name is there with your school name or Luddy major, and it's wonderful to see how many people's lives it is changing. So- The only uh, unfortunate one from that, I think, is my, my nephew, Nick Luddy, uh, who will get a degree from the Luddy School, and I'm thinking on his resume, people are gonna think he was homeschooled. <laughs> exactly. So Fred, uh, you are so humble. You are an inspiration to so many 
entrepreneurs around the world on where you started the journey. Uh, just before you turned 50, have you survived the financial crisis, how the company went public in 2012, and how the company continues to grow to delight customers. And, you know, I would say one thing, Fred, is cons uh, Fred has been awarded, you know, top 100 innovators by Forbes magazine. He was on cover of Forbes magazine in 2018. ServiceNow was voted as the most innovative company. And all of that started with Fred Luddy in 2003. So Fred, thank you for spending time with us. Uh, thank you for honoring Tycon with your presence and knowledge. And namaste, everyone, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you.